So uh, I think it's the film. Mike's working all right. Are you happy with the volume out the back? Yep. Excellent. So uh, yes, thank you for coming along. We'll probably have a few people drifting in um, towards, but we're starting to fill up, so that's good. Um, Jolene, my partner, and also my, my present presentation partner this evening. Uh, I grew up on a, a farm in Pemberton, so uh, that's down south, for those that are not aware, down in Cary country. So I grew up on a bit of a, uh, a food-growing, self-sufficient kind of uh, lifestyle down there. And um, I guess, like everyone, I moved to, moved to Perth to get a, a university education down there, those that are getting an education, and um, had a young family, and then found my way gradually back into organic growing, um, food production, and just the... Um, healthy, happy living, I guess, uh, that I wanted my family to, to grow up appreciating as well. So that's been a bit of a journey for, for myself, and uh, you know, Jolene's been on a similar journey. She's a city girl, so uh, for her, half the stuff I've been ranting on about, about soil health and plants and, and mineralisation in food and how important community is and all these things, um, was a bit lost on her for years. but. Uh, I think we're starting to see quite a lot of eye to eye now. So much that Jolene's now doing a soil science PhD at um, UWA. So you know, full full cycle there. We're both uh, trained as chemical engineers, so fairly um, sciencey chemical background, um, which does help with some of the, the thinking that goes into building soils and water and looking after the plants. So hopefully we can share some of uh, our learnings with you this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about food gardens, uh, how to how to set up your backyards as, as food gardens or work in elements <coughs> of food gardening in your backyard on um, the micro scale and on the macro scale. Um, we'll talk about concepts of food forests and getting uh, larger, tr larger trees and understory edible plants into the backyard as well. <coughs> Uh, managing a bit of shade and things like that and we'll just come up with a few different ideas hopefully that you haven't heard before about um, getting productivity in the backyard uh, both from a food, <coughs> food perspective for us and from a, um, a biological perspective so hopefully we're while we're producing food for us and growing food for us we're also creating a habitat for natural systems insects predators birds and those sorts of things as well because um, if you don't know it already, by the end of tonight, hopefully you're thinking that those guys that come into our garden do a lot of work for us. And while, while they can be annoying at times, you know, they're all part of the system. And uh, it's, it's our job to help that system reach some point of order in our backyards so that um, we're smiling and happy when we see insects and birds coming into the garden rather than having them destroy our crops. So the, the start, we'll have a look through a few um, slides. Uh, of gardens, so I might just chat about them, have to look at a few pictures of what, what can be food gardens out there. Um, if you, it's, it's a fairly big group, so we're going to have uh, 20 minutes at the end at least of Q&A, so question time. Um, if you have a burning question, you're welcome to come and ask it at break time. If you have one that uh, is due to the fact that I've said something that's clearly wrong, if you can beat Jolene to jump in and tell me, you're welcome to. But, um, Otherwise, we'll probably keep this as a, as a, as a, as a discussion and then um, keep the questions coming afterwards. But feel free to jot them down. We're happy to answer that kind of uh, questions towards the end. And this will be just touching on many, many issues. So we're not doing anything in great detail tonight. We're introducing a lot of new concepts. Um, one of the, the main themes for Terra Perma Design, our business is to Every time we run a workshop, it all goes up on our website. It's open source, freely downloadable. So every time we're producing material, it goes up there and people can access it. So the notes from this workshop and many other workshop before's notes, uh, there's a little business card with Terraperma Design out the back. So if you want to grab our website off there, you can just navigate your way to our website and grab a copy of any of the notes on any of the topics that we talk about tonight. So happy to, I'll mention that again towards the end. So, you know, uh, our, this is our, our verge. So we had a discussion about, you know, what's the topic of this, this, this uh, workshop is how to, how to fit gardens and veggies in the backyard. Well, actually, you know, food can be on the front verge as well. So backyard is probably one of those euphemisms for this evening. We can be growing it in a community garden. We can be growing it on our verge. 
and I had a bit of a look at City of June Gloves um, verge policies. Now you need uh, one and a half metres clearance from the road and you can't, um, you can't have any growth over uh, walkways and the vegetation needs to be below 600 mil high um, but otherwise there's no reason why you can't be, be practicing edible gardening or native verges. So there's no need to be paving our verges. Um, if you have any, have any problems with that, certainly the council encourages you to send in a submission with what you're planning to do and a design on it. So I encourage you to, you know, your food garden, certainly in our backyard, I've got a, a 30 metre um, Queensland box in the backyard, which gives me a huge amount of shade in winter, which is not ideal. So I'm gardening in winter on the verge and in summer in the backyard where there's lots of shade. So this idea of just having one raised garden veggie bed in one space in the backyard, hopefully, you know, we're thinking about this idea of mobile spaces, mobile um, planting zones, or areas that grow in winter and shut down in winter and grow in summer and shut down in summer, you know, a changeover. Because really we need quite different conditions in winter and summer. Uh, you know, an edible garden space, one metre by one metre is more than enough. There's a concept called uh, square foot gardening out there. For the, for, the, for the new gardener, this is a really attractive technique where the, the soil mix, the watering, the seed planting, what to plant when, everything is really prescriptive in there. So there's little to go wrong, if you like. I find it way too limiting, personally. Um, because it tells you exactly what to plant, exactly where and what mixes to use. But it is a very safe way of experimenting for the first time with gardens and producing edible crops. So, um, you know, that's, that's worth looking into. If gardening has, has not worked for you, if food gardening has not worked in the past, perhaps it will work with square foot gardening. Uh, a lot of places I go to now, there's uh, a lot of uh, water gardens in. And water is a really useful agent to have in the backyard, feeding uh, predators, bringing in frogs and wasps and dragonflies and all those good things. But there's actually a lot of food plants, aquatic food plants, that we can be growing in water zones as well in our backyard. So um, this is a picture from a place called Jetto's Patch. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with that and you use Facebook, it's worth looking up Jetto's Patch. Um, they have an insane amount of edible plants in a, in, a, in a normal size urban backyard and front yard, something like 300 varieties of fruit and vegetables. Um, actually, it might be something like 300 varieties of fruit trees. So it's amazing what you can fit in and how you can set it up if you're, if you're really keen on it. And uh, you know, introducing this concept that uh, food gardens, you know, is it a garden or is it a forest? You look at that picture there, I don't know how clear these pictures are coming out at the back. It would be nice if they're a bit bigger. But you can see that that garden has a distinct canopy layer. You know, it's a bit like a forest, but everything in that forest is edible. You've got nut trees up the top, you've got citrus in the middle, you've got, um, they've got pineapples and things on the lower layers, and sweet potatoes and other ground covers growing in with their chicory and their broccoli and their kale and other things. So a really diverse idea of a garden going on there. And we'll discuss a bit the, the idea of weeds and flowers as edible plants. You know, so we don't have to be growing the mainstream vegetables. That's not the only thing we can eat. I present workshops on uh, edible weeds. So it's coming towards the end of edible weed season because it's coming towards the end of rainy season. And uh, most things are dead during summer. Um, but there are many, many weeds that, that people are pulling out every day and have for the last 60 years of their life and they're actually more minerally nutritious than, than the veggies that they're putting after they've weeded out those weeds. So uh, another area that's well worth doing a bit of research and thinking about. And we can certainly take, if you're, if you're starting from scratch and you've got a sand pit out the back, which a lot of us have, um, you can certainly move from a sand pit to a garden pretty rapidly. Now we can do that by spending loads and loads of money, but that's, that's generally not our preference. We're permaculturalists or e ecologists, if you like, so spending lots of money is, um, and bringing in lots of resources from off-site is not something that we tend to promote that much. Um, but things like mulch and organic matter and manures and clays 
if we use them wisely, we can rapidly go from sand into a, a productive backyard. For those that like a, a more, um, an easier solution, perhaps you're in a, on a balcony, perhaps you're in a multi-storey dwelling, or in a small patio backyard, I mean, that thing's about the size of a barbecue, and it has, has its own water and nutrient holding underneath it, so when, the, when you water this, um, the nutrients and water flush down through the soil zone and then they sit in the bottom like a self-watering pot and come back up through capillary action. So this thing's about a metre by a metre or can be a three metres by a metre, obviously it's modular and uh, it's managing the watering, it's managing the pest exclusion and on all of those things. So, you know, not my cup of tea either, but certainly these are, are very um, simple, doable, but perhaps not so cost effective gardening techniques that we can be using in, in either a pretty wild existing garden or, or a new micro space garden. This is uh, a bit of integrated gardening where they've got water and aquaponics on, on one side there and the, the liquid waste, if you like, from the pond is going into those wicking beds on the other side. So if, if we know we've got really weak sandy soils, we can either improve them with loads of clay and organic matter, or we can try and create these, these kinds of gardening systems with a container in the bottom that holds the water and nutrients and allows it to capillary back up into the soil. We'll talk a bit more about that. You know, and if this is your idea of gardening to start with, there's nothing wrong with that either. So sprouting some avocado seeds, um, Whatever makes it happen, sweet potatoes, Jolene's having a crack with sweet potatoes and potatoes and anything that she can possibly germinate that came from the shop first. She's, uh, she's loving that. So they, they can be planted in the garden later and we can graft those into a known variety of avocado. So there's a lot to be said for growing plants from seed. They develop really good quality root systems. Um, and then we can top graft them with a, with a known variety of avocado, even if they don't bear. So that's, this little experiment and fun we have is actually pretty functional as well. Uh, this is a food garden that uh, I set up in an organic store just on a tarmac back area. So this is a car park out the back of the shop. So underneath that mulch on the ground is this tarmac. So the mulch is about 10, 15 centimetres thick. And they are all what we call wicking barrels. So they're self-contained barrels with a water, a water zone in the bottom. And uh, there was 65 of them or something, and I was supplying the green veg for the, for the store's kitchen, and some of it was going into for sale at the store anyway. So this is gardening without soil, if you like. So we're complaining that we've got sand. Well, that's, that's gardening on tarmac. So you can do anything you want. Don't be limited by the fact that we have crappy sand. But we need to understand that we have crappy sand, and therefore not pump lots of fertilizer and, and other things and waste our resources and damage the, the ecosystems around us um, with the poor sands. And the other bonus of that one is if it's a rental and you don't want to invest too much in the property or you think you might be moving uh, pretty soon, then at least you've got your mobile garden to go with you. It was heavy, but that whole garden moved off site to another place and it was tarmac when we left. So the tarmac was a little bit browner than it was to start with, but it was all going to get demolished anyway. So you know, this, is, this is something we can do on a, on a patio area, on a second story balcony, anywhere like that. Uh, these things weigh about 60 kilos, self-contained, and you should be able to water them once a week. So they don't need fancy reticulation systems either. This might be most people's idea of a, a backyard veggie, veggie integration. So we've got the, the standard raised garden bed um, there and a nice area to be in, lots of flowers and, and a nice space just with a dedicated veggie growing area. So you know that, that's a backyard food garden too. And if that's what people are getting on with and growing their veggies in, that is a great way to grow lots of good, good quality healthy food. If you put good quality healthy soil in the beds. And this is an interesting one. Uh, a lady in Frio did a, a swimming pool conversion. So she's got a natural swimming pool there. Um, so where you see the water, and it's all beautifully landscaped, and all edibles in there, all got a colas and watercress and other things, bulrush, um, water parsley. She's got a few lilies in there as well. 
So she's, she can swim in that, she's got fish in there, um, edible fish in there, she's got edible plants in there, and the kids had moved out and the pool was um, being wasted, if you like, just needing lots of treatment. So that's an option for us too. So if that was, uh, you know, if that was what food gardening or integrating food gardening in our backyard can look like, how do we go about doing it, I guess, is the, is the big question. And what are the, some of the things that hold us back in Perth? Um, you know, sun, I think, is the biggest thing. So the sun out there is, is beautiful. If you lived in Europe and you had six months of frozen soils and you heard Australians whinging about having too much sun, you know, the irony would be kind of, they'd be just whacking themselves in the head going, what are you guys whinging about? I can't even grow for six months unless I have a greenhouse a fully thermally heated greenhouse. So we do have a blessing and a curse in the sun. Um, uh, a lot of European techniques have come over uh, with the people that have migrated from those areas, with still people thinking that you need six hours of full summer sun to grow veggies. Now that's not the case. That's a good way to kill veggies. Perhaps six hours of full winter sun is good for growing most veggies, but there's a definite change. You know, the best summer sun is probably between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. So once it's past that, it's really fatiguing. Just dropping in and out a bit. It's really fatiguing um, the plants and making the plants stressed and sick and bitter. So really we're, we're either positioning our gardens so they get morning sun in summer and then dapple shade over the rest of the day or we're trying to set up uh, maybe some tree canopy that gives us some shade, or we're putting in shade sales or something like that, if we grow vegetables over summer. Now, if we grow vegetables over summer, realistically, it's a hard time to be growing veggies, so I don't recommend you to start in summer. Have a crack in spring, finish up in December, and then start gardening again um, when the rains start in winter. We, we don't need to be self-sufficient. We're just practicing gardening. We're growing some, some of our own food. Um, so in the early stages, perhaps let's not garden during summer, maybe just growing sweet potatoes or something. And that's the thing, I think, over summer is you're setting up your garden to grow its soil, potentially. So you're protecting the soil and what you've invested in throughout the year so you don't lose all that being baked in the sun. And then you can regenerate it ready for the next year. Another technique that we don't want to be doing is uh, the idea of having fallow soil. So exposed soil that's being rested by nuclear radiation from the sun doesn't occur here. So in Europe, they had such good soils and such mild conditions that they could rest soil, leave it without a crop, and it would be better next year. That won't happen in Australia. The soil will die. It needs plants, it needs shade, it needs moisture. So we're not wanting to do that, but certainly we can rest it by, by mulching it or rest it by putting uh, uh, something like a sweet potato vine across the nasturtiums in winter, sweet potatoes in summer. You can't go wrong with that. Um, I guess the, so working with the sun is the key thing. Uh, if we're sharing summer sun between four or five different trees, then four or five different trees are happy sharing that summer sun. If that's felting down on one poor little macadamia that we've decided is a bush food so it should be able to sit out in the middle of the sun all day, then, then the macadamia is going to die. So macadamia is an understory rainforest tree. So not until it's five or ten years old is it coming out into full sun. But you know, we think that these plants are bush foods, so they should be able to withstand anything. Um, so using sun intelligently is a topic that we're going to spend a little bit more time on shortly. Uh, the other thing for us is busy lives. So most of us are working full time. Um, if we're not, we have plenty of other social commitments. So how do we how do we grow food that perhaps needs daily attention um, in our backyards? How do we set it up so it can we can either do it daily, or how do we set it up so we only need to tend to it weekly and it still survives? Now that, that's the reality of getting this garden that either th thrives or fails. The other thing we've got to deal with uh, that, that other people in other areas don't is the poor soil. Now some of you might not be in 100% sand, but I'm guessing if you're from Joondala and you haven't just snuck in here from the hills, um, then you will be on crappy deep sand that might be 20 or 30 metres deep. 
Now, when, I, when I'm trying to explain what sand is, and people think it's soil, I say, no, it's more like the windscreen of your car. You know, it is just silica, and the only difference is it's not all one big sheet of glass. It's broken up bits of your windscreen. So if you think about trying to garden, trying to get water into those bits of glass, if we try and think about trying to get um, bacteria and fungi into those bits of glass, you know, it's impossible. So we need to improve our sand, um, or we need to not garden in our sandy soils with uh, vegetables that need a high amount of water and nutrients. I'm not saying we can't grow natives and we can't grow some fruit trees, but let's be a bit realistic about what the capacity of our native sandy soils are. They never grew a rainforest before we came here. There's no reason they'll do it after we've destroyed the soil some more. Um, so the, relate, the relation with that, that weak sandy soil and, and the fact that it really is just cubes of glass is that it's not going to hold much water or fertiliser. So we can flood it on, we have it, it's available to us and we can afford it, so we can water every day and fertilise every day. Um, but it's not something we should be doing, it's bad for our budget and it's certainly bad for the environment. So improving our soil by adding clay and organic matter and plant matter and growing plants or containerizing our gardens and not trying to achieve the unachievable in sand is what we should be should be doing. One of those two things. And you know this idea of pests and weeds. Now, thankfully, I've moved along a bit from hating pests and weeds to actually appreciating that they have an ecological role. Therefore, I can tolerate them more. I eat my weeds now, and the rest go to the chickens because that I can't eat, that I don't like, or I'm composting them. And the pests, well, the pests are actually just the food for the predators. So once I can deal with the fact that I'm losing some of my crop to these pests in the early stages, I know that the predators are all going to come in and they're going to eat those pests. And so I think everyone here is probably happy that predators, so ladybirds, um, birds like wattle birds, uh, chickens, yeah, definitely frogs, lizards, dragonflies, all of these things are, are predators in the backyard. But, you know, it's pretty obvious when it's, when it's put like that, the only reason they're in your backyard is because there's lots of food for them to eat. So if we don't allow any pests to ever be in our backyard, we're never going to have any predators in our backyard because there's no food for them to eat. And it's very logical when we explain it like that, but when we're just looking at the pests destroying our crop, it's very hard to step back and say, well, you know, perhaps I need to let this happen a bit, so next year, I'm getting ladybirds in to control these aphids. Or I'm getting paper wasps in to control these caterpillars. Because you'll never get the paper wasps if you kill the caterpillars before they're allowed to breed up. So that took a bit longer than I expected, that little intro, but that's all right. But hopefully most people are aware that in summer the sun is going through a much higher arc. My, my uh, buttons are not up for that arc. So we're looking at about 80%, 80% elevation in the sky. You know, that's why we have these eaves and things to protect our walls in summer. So if we're thinking about that, and the sun is actually coming back from right back behind us. You know, so the sun will actually shine on the back wall of your house if you're elevated enough. So it's rising from the south side and coming through. So that's a, that's a lot of sun, a lot of intense sun coming down on your block. So how that sun hits your block in the morning, midday and the afternoon is something of interest to us. Because if we know that morning summer sun is good, and midday and definitely afternoon summer sun is bad for plants, then let's have a look at our block and try and analyse where we're getting morning sun. So that's, that's the best place to garden or put worm farms, perhaps, or put nurseries. The other thing to do then is to think about those areas that are getting too much sun, well, they're going to be too hot and wasted space anyway. So what's the, what's the best thing to put in front of sunlight? Trees? Yeah, so it's not solar panels. We all think it's solar panels because we get a bit of electricity from it, but there's no comparison between the efficiency of trees at converting solar energy into something useful and solar panels at converting energy into something useful. Trees win hands down. We haven't managed to copy photosynthesis yet, and we're trying madly to do it, but... Um, 
So we want to get trees in front of the sun. We want to get multiple trees at multiple heights all sharing the sunlight. Because the default position there is even if the tree grows too big, we can at least chop it down and turn it into mulch and we've got organic matter for the garden. If we don't use the sun, or if we put a shade cloth in front of the sun and we use man-made objects, we know that they're just going to break down and we'll have to replace them next year or in three years' time. So it's convenient to use shade cloths and I've used them too, but certainly if we can use the sun and welcome the sun as an energy source rather than a problem, we're starting to think about it from the right perspective, if that makes sense. Um, and if we can think about how the sun moves through the sky and where it is on our block at different times of day, summer is a big issue, but winter is a big issue too, because we actually need lots of sun in winter. So there are areas, lots of areas on your block that will be too shaded in winter to be growing good quality, um, high yielding vegetables. So we need to look at our block during summer and look at our block during winter so this idea of a sector analysis or a plan, seeing where the sun and the shade is, is important to us. And, and it's, worth, it's the first stage of figuring out where to garden, if that makes sense. Um, some, things we, some things we might consider sun and shade are important, but I certainly want to be thinking about the breezes and winds, views, and other things as well. That hot easterly that comes through your garden, that will kill your plants as fast as the sun will. And the stormy winds that come through in winter might destroy your garden pretty badly and they're laden in salt too. So working with these natural forces around our, our gardens and yards is important. We want to work with them and work with them intelligently because they're here for the long haul, longer than we are. And uh, you know that sun, that summer sun pattern that's too intense, it's going to be too intense all your life. So we might as well start working on it now. Um, recognising that, that these, these annoying solar patterns of too much sun in summer, it is a pattern. So every year the summer comes strong at certain times a year and we can work with this. So there's evergreen trees that have their leaves all through winter and all through summer and there's deciduous trees which are trees that lose their leaves in winter. Now if we can have deciduous trees in the right places on our block, we're letting uh, we're protecting ourselves from summer sun and we're letting in winter sun. So that's sounding like a good idea in some areas of our block. Because we know the patterns and the seasons of the sun, we should be able to intelligently work with them. And we've got trees that already work with them. So let's work with the trees and let's have a double win. I'll just add something in there. Um, when it comes to the seasonal change, if you're going home, and then thinking about your shade patterns. We're currently at the equinox, approximately last week. Um, so what that means is you are part way between full winter sun, when the sun is going across low in the sky, and that goes across at its peak is about just over 30 degrees. So for every metre your object is, it's about one and a half metres long in shadow. We're halfway across through spring. As we go into summer and the sun is getting higher and higher at its peak, <coughs> December 22nd, I think this year is the peak, um, you'll be up at that 80 degrees and your shadow from that is about 0.15 of your height. Does that make sense? So it just gives you an idea if you're going home well, obviously not tonight, uh, but tomorrow or on the weekend, and you're having a look at the shadow patterns as they move throughout the day, we're halfway. So you can then extrapolate it for winter and get a feel for where the shade is going to be in your garden, and then you can shorten it up and have a look at what's going to get cooked and what might need to be adjusted for summer. So the other thing to look at when we're looking at the big structures in the backyard to plan around is the views. So we might want some good sea views, we might want to screen off some neighbours, we might want to screen off some ugly walls or some sheds. Again, we can use a man-made object to do that or we can use trees and vegetation, whether it's, it's native plants, food trees, citrus make really nice screens, lo lovely dark, um, shiny green leaves and an evergreen screen. So if we want to screen something off all year, it's pointless putting a deciduous tree there because we're going to be looking at what we don't want to see all winter. So you know, as I say, different trees, different functions and different characteristics, knowing a little bit about them 
or at least knowing what we want to achieve in that space, we can then go down to the nursery and, and ask the nursery person for, for a tree advice for this kind of characteristics for this space to achieve this. Now, we don't need to know what we want. We just need to know what we want to achieve. Now, there's a lot of nurseries or hardware stores that you probably can't go to and ask for that advice. So perhaps, you know, try and go to a, a, an actual nursery if you're looking for proper um, tree advice. And what we've looked at there is, of course, things outside your block that affect you. So um, before we step on to the, the more inside your block, which I think you're about to step on to, it, it's, if you're thinking about things outside your block that might annoy you, or so if it might then that is also noise, um, it may be a hot breeze, there may be a neighbour's air conditioner that's mounted on the wall just above the, the fence that's coming across and creating a, a sort of an artificial breeze. But it's that when you're thinking about your garden as you go home, think about all those things outside your property that you can't specifically change, but you can then put something within your property that will adjust it to something more pleasant for you. So if you, if you get the large scale stuff right, if you get the patterns right, if you get the broad issues, climate, landscape, and all of those things right, the small stuff, i.e. growing vegetables, will actually, nature can grow vegetables quite comfortably if we give it a realistic hope. So if we can get the, the broader, and more important <coughs> patterns of fertility and sunshine and those sorts of things happening in our backyard, so set up a good ecology, we can actually easily grow healthy vegetables. But if we don't have a good understanding of those things, then it's very hard to grow healthy vegetables, no matter how much we spend on the process. So when we're looking at site analysis, so figuring out where to put these veggie beds, or figuring out where to put uh, you know, plucking greens that we want to be accessing every day, and we want to be putting them close to the kitchen, that's sounding like a good thing, nice and close. Um, we want to, want to have it accessible, so we want to have good pathways. Now, when we talk about designing good functioning gardens, we talk about thinking about your habits and pathways. So, where you walk on your way to work every day. That is a place that you will go past once or twice a day that you can, with no extra effort, tend to things that need frequent attention. So, when you're looking at your garden, think about how the sun moves, think about the shade and those sorts of things, but also think about your pathways through the garden. And put the things that need lots of attention that you, you want to interact with daily, put them on those locations in the shady or sunny parts that you've already figured out from the first stage. Then we're making design that inherently works as opposed to inherently fails. If we put the worm farm or the seedlings in the back of the block where we only go once a week, when you get busy they're going to die. I mean it's it's common sense, it's a no-brainer, but you know this is how we come up with design that functionally works in your backyard. Then figuring out where the veggies go again is academic once you get this other stuff right. Um, for, for your planning, if you're into that kind of thing, I wouldn't be making uh, pathways much narrower than half a metre. And if you're wanting to get wheelbarrows or wheelchairs or something like that, then you wouldn't be much narrower than um, 0.8 metres. Um, another thing to think about is when we're reaching in, uh, on, a, on ground level, we can only be reaching in um, about 0.7 metres. So if we're going to have a, a garden bed that we can only access from one side because it's the back fence, and we don't want to step in the garden beds, is something we certainly don't want to be doing when we've built really good, healthy, fluffy, quality soil. We don't want to be stomping on it continuously. So we need to design our beds so they have good access. So if we can get to them from one side, 0.7 metres, if we can get to them from two sides, so both sides of the garden bed, then obviously you can times that by two. So you're looking at 1.4 metres. And if we're having nice high raised beds, clearly you can go a bit further then because we can reach much further in on a raised bed. But if we're reaching right down on the ground, I mean, you can map it out yourself. Reach down and when you start falling over, that's how wide your garden bed's going to be. <coughs> and the idea, I was talking to a fellow down here, he's just set himself up some more vertical space. And so this idea of we might have a tiny little flat postage stamp backyard, but you've, you've got four or five metres up. So we're four or five metres long and four or five metres high, we've just tripled 
or more our space. So vertical gardening, and I don't mean sort of putting putting tiny little plant pots higher up. That's a good way to kill plants too, unless it's winter. So vertical gardening is a technique, but I'm talking about using the vertical space. So vines and climbing plants need uh, trellises, and they use vertical space, but they grow in the ground. If, so here's a question for you. If we've got a metre by a metre of soil, does that hold more water than a tiny pot plant about this big? Yeah, so it's going to be more resilient when summer comes. So when we put soil and plants in tiny little pots, as soon as summer comes, they dry out in a couple of hours and we lose those vertical gardens. But if we actually vertically garden with trees, which is a pretty crazy concept, but I know, trees and uh, vines, then we're actually gardening in the bulkier soil in the ground. It has more resilience over summer because it can hold more water and more nutrients. Now the other thing about your design is it's for you, it's for the owner. So your, your pathways, your habits, your needs, some of us have got kids, some of us don't have kids anymore. Some of us have got dogs. Dogs are pretty challenging to design for when they want to dig up and eat everything. Um, you know, that, that can be challenging, perhaps we exclude them, perhaps we try and occupy them more so they don't have such bad habits. But Everyone's design in this room, if you went home and started <coughs> trying to figure out how to do a design in your backyard, would be um, individual to your needs. So just listening to some fellow like myself or some lady like my wife and doing exactly what we say is, is not the way to go. You need to be thinking about what you need and what you want and what you like to eat, the layout of your backyard and where the sun is and what your habits are, and trying to make a design that, that works for you, if that makes sense. In our backyard, we, we certainly wanted chickens. Um, we had kids. Chickens are, are really nice with kids. I mean, you can have a dog or a cat, or you can have a chicken. Dogs and cats lay things that I don't like, and chickens lay things that I do like. So, you know, to me, it's a no-brainer. Um, another, another question for you is, are we going to garden in the soil? So we, when, we, when we garden our veggies or we grow our fruit trees, are we going to put them in the ground, in the sandy ground, and improve the soil and the sand? Or are we going to put them in containers? I mean, if you have to be mobile and it's a rental and you want to keep everything in pots, then, then that's an obvious decision. You don't want to spend a couple of thousand dollars improving the soil when you're going to move out in six months. But you might be going to live there for 20 years. There's still good reasons to be container gardening. So there's still good reasons to be growing your tomatoes, uh, all your leafy greens, all your herbs in containerized pots because they are high production plants and high production plants don't grow well in very average sand. You know, so we can grow some fruit trees, we can grow some perennial herbs, some, some hardy herbs, we can grow some Mediterranean trees, um, we can grow some natives in the backyard, and that's two-thirds of the backyard. Those things will grow in fairly crappy sandy soil, because that's where they came from, and they can cope with it. But your veggies can't. So we can have that system, and we can have some containerized food growing beds um, blended in amongst that. So we're using all of the predator habitat and the ecology from all of that broader garden that's not using many resources and on the sand, and we're squeezing in our veggie beds in and around that. So that's sounding like a pretty sensible way to garden, even if you could get five tonnes of clay and, and create a clay loam in your backyard. The other bonus of the containerised gardening is if we're on sandy soil, which is typically alkaline, but we have a, a blueberry fetish, we're not going to spend all the money to convert soil to become acidic um, because that's going to continuously wash away and you will be continuously spending that money. Um, you might elect then to do that in containers so you can have your, your, your need or your want um, with the limited resources put to it and then it's just a replenishing of a small space rather than we are trying to transfer. So those pictures up there, um, the one on the right is a, is a pretty much a burial ground where I dug a grave site <coughs> and uh, my neighbours are looking at me quite curiously because that's in the front verge. That, that's, you know, we saw the front verge 
that was that we had uh, five graves to start with. <laughs> um, they did look particularly suspicious. It's, it sorts out the questions that you would otherwise get from the neighbours when you're doing some, some verge gardening. They don't question us anymore. <laughs> so one of the reasons I went for this technique on the verge is we're not allowed to put fixed structures in the verge. So like you, I'm in the city of Stirling, like you, we can't have veggie plants or pots or other things in the verge. Putting clay in the soil, so what I did there is I, I put a clay liner down, if you like, and that was going to seal this base of this garden bed, the same way a dam builder would, would seal a leaky dam with bentonite clay. So I'm creating a, a dish, if you like, that stops the water and nutrients before they leach straight out into 20 metres deep of sand underneath my veggies, um, which is says, a good thing. When he says a clay liner, that's just clay poured in, and as soon as you add the water, the clay expands and seals. So that's how you get your, your, your water reservoir at the bottom. And the, uh, the other container there, that's just a broccoli box. So if you're familiar with the polystyrene box that you get at the um, fruit and veggie stores, that's just one of those. And this far up, so maybe three inches up, less than that, two inches up, I've just put one hole in the side of the broccoli box. And I've put wood chips to the height of that hole, that drain hole, wood chips in the bottom, and then soil on top or potting mix on top. Now they were the quickest, easiest, cheapest um, growing boxes that I've ever made, except that polystyrene breaks down in the sun. So unless you're going to protect it from the UV rays, it doesn't last very long. But when we started the, the garden at the organic store, so that one that you saw that was all olive barrels in the end, larger barrels, that started out as little poly boxes. And they did some tests on the, on the leaching out of chemicals in those boxes, because they're a certified organic store, and there was no measurable chemicals coming out of those little boxes. The other benefit of those is they're insulated, they're a little esky, so they're quite good at keeping soil cool during the summer, as well as a container that doesn't leak. Um, so, you know, how do we, if we're, if we're gonna, if we're gonna garden in containers, then we're less interested in putting lots of clay in the soil, because we have this container down in the bottom, this little reservoir holder down in the bottom that catches the water and makes it available to us through capillary action. So we don't need to put 5 or 10% clay in the soil anymore because the water and nutrient management is controlled artificially, if that makes sense. If we're not going to do that, if we're going to improve our sandy soils, um, you know, the common discussion is we want to move towards a loamy type of soil. So a loamy type of soil is one that is just not sand, but it's got clay and silt and other particles in it, which have a different effect on the soil, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So we want to go for this you know, blended texture of sand, silt and clay in, in our soil. So if we know we've got 100% sand, it's pretty simple what we need to be adding. Um, but if we just put sand, silt and clay in, plants and fungi and bacteria and other things don't grow from sand, silt and clay. So what else do we need in the soil? Compost, yeah, organic matter, anything of those kinds of things. So hopefully something that's there and available for the, for the soil and bacteria to eat straight away, which is the compost. And maybe something on top protecting the soil and providing a slow release of nutrients and organic matter like a mulch on top. So then we've got, in the soil we've got the sand, the silt and the clay, making a quite a nice soil that holds water and minerals. And then we've got a whole bunch of maybe 5%. 5% is all the organic matter you need in a healthy soil. So a lot of us are going and buying a big bag of compost and we're gardening in compost. That's 100% organic matter. A lot of that is just lost. So if we don't control the leaching of our nutrients and the organic matter into the sand, I'm sure a lot of us have gone out and bought $500 worth of um, garden soil and, and done the raised garden bed and after a year the raised garden bed is just sand. So the, the plants or the soil, the bacteria and the fungi eat the organic matter and feed the plants. That's what's happening. So it's, it's no great surprise that there's less organic matter at the end of the year when we've harvested a bunch of crops. But unfortunately as the compost is breaking down it's getting finer and finer particle size and if you think about uh, a grain of um, clay 
is microscopic and we can't see it, and a grain of sand is the size of that football field over there. That's kind of the things we're working with. Organic matter is maybe the size of a tennis ball. So these little bits of organic matter are falling down through a really deep sandy system and being lost to us. Once we've, uh, once we've dealt with the soil texture, we're then adding that organic matter and then we're trying to remineralize our soils. So we have some of the oldest soils in the world in Perth and I think we've been, we've been categorized, big stamp on the forehead. West Australia has the worst soils in the world. It's been uh, certified, we are. Fashendine sand is the worst, so we're not quite that bad, but I think we're probably second. So it's recognised that the soil is rubbish, it's recognised that it's not soil, it's glass. So if we want to get minerals into the soil and health into the soil, we need to add organic matter, and we also need to add minerals. Trace elements, micro elements, macro elements, things like um, rock minerals, ground up um, basalt, and ground up granite, that would naturally happen if we had volcanoes going on. Pretty good that we don't, but you know, we don't have any minerals. So, And uh, another thing that you could consider adding is the kelp. So I guess if basalt and uh, granite powders from the volcanoes are the earth minerals and the, the soil minerals, then I see kelp as the sea minerals. So lots of uh, minerals and trace elements in kelp that aren't in the basalt and lots of other growth stimulants and plant health, soil health chemicals are in, in kelps, in seaweeds as well. I've just got sand, can I test that? Yes you can. So if you get an empty jar that's about this big, clear jar, straight walls, yeah, probably like that one over there, and you fill it full of 50% of the soil that you want to test. Now if you just scoop off the organic matter on the top and do a test on that, you're going to funnily enough have lots of organic matter, but you want a representative sample of the soil. So perhaps go 30 centimetres deep where your veggies are going to be in the, in the soil. Um, take a sample of that, half, half full of the jar with soil, and then half full of the water, and then shake it up. What's that one, so what you'll find, and we can have a look at these in the break, what you'll find is the sand drops out very fast, the silt drops out slower, and the clays and the fine organic matters, they stay um, in suspension for longer and settle on the top. So we can actually look at the jar and say, well, this jar is 60% sand. So your soil is 60% sand. And uh, most of ours are 80 to 90% sand. Um, so if we talk about how do we improve that, there's this idea of a, a triangle that represents the, the soil spectrum of all sand, all clay, and all silt. We want to be somewhere in the middle. See that red zone, which is low? You might not be able to see it, but um, a, a, a slideshow of these notes will be available to download from the website. So apologies if you can't see it tonight. We want to be looking at low. You know, so figuring out, doing a jar shake test and figuring out what you have is the best way to figure out what you need. So you can ask any any fellow at the at the the hardware store what products you need in your garden, but actually, unless he's done a jar shake test, he can't really tell you, he'll just sell you something. This is easy, simple for anyone here to do now. So it's not a $100 test or something, we just do as many as we want. So we can do one on the veggie bed, we can do one on the verge. I mean, they're free and easy and quick to do. And that will tell us what we've got. And you will find that you will vary hugely around the property. So that's the other thing, is it's encouraged to do it in multiple spots because doing it, okay, I want a garden here right now, yes, that's fine, but if you're preparing your whole property, you want to have, um, you don't want to be putting the same amount of clay to fix an area that might not actually need it because the person who lived in the house before gardened there. So it's just important, yeah, get a random sand. There are plenty of places where there's a lot of the bricky sands uh, left after the build and they're quite high in clay. So, you know, you might, your natural clay will be fairly alkaline and fairly straight, uh, sorry, sand will be fairly alkaline and fairly straight sand, but everyone's building block for their house is not the natural sand that was there. <laughs> so, depending on what happened when they were building your house, depends on what little pockets of soil you'll have around your block. So, it is worth having a look at them individually. So we talked about organic matter. So you know, compost is the obvious what is organic matter, but actually anything that was living is living 
probably better not to turn that into compost because you get a few questions asked, but it's, it's doable if the neighbor's cats are bad or something. Um, anything that, that, that was living can be turned into compost. So I guess you know, there's a nice mantra, I think it's um, Earth Care is the habit, which is we want to have, um, have full lives but empty bins. So if we're recycling most of our glass and paper and plastics that can be recycled, um, we're avoiding a bunch of things, but we always, if we're having a healthy um, whole food lifestyle, like a lot of us want to have now, there's always going to be a lot of veggie waste. So that's the opportunity to start cycling that into your garden. So if you aren't gardening now and you have a bunch of organic matter waste from just shopping and buying all your veggies and fruit, then that's a good opportunity to, to actually start composting that working it into the garden in your little veggie bed and actually closing the loop on, the, on that wasted stuff that's going into the bin and doesn't need to be. So um, Getty's bins, so you know, uh, I call them Daleks, but the bins with the lids on where you just throw your food waste in there and maybe a bit of carbon and then a bit more nitrogen and then a bit more carbon. Now that's slow, cold composting. You can generally keep most of the problems out of there if you don't put too much food waste in all at once because food waste is all nitrogen and it is very dense and the idea of having good composting is we're looking for 30 times as much carbon as nitrogen. So the common statement is a 30 to 1 ratio for good composting of carbon to nitrogen. You know, so if our food waste is pretty much all nitrogen and water then we need to add 30 times as much of that as a, from a carbon source for that to compost healthily in one of those Getty's bins. Which is where most people go wrong, because they're just continually putting food waste in there. And then the carbon sources are things like the dry leaf litter, um, paper is another aspect. Uh, what else would you call as carbon sources? What's that? Mulch, yes, so any, yeah. any dried organic. Dry grass clippings, mulch, uh, anything like that. You can start working cardboard and other things into there as well. But realistically, if it's clean, good quality cardboard, it's better off being recycled as cardboard than, than you putting it into your compost. Because you should have enough leaf prunings and, and leaf drop and uh, free mulch and other things in your block without having to go to clean cardboard and, and rip it up into little bits and put it into your compost. <coughs> And if you're just starting out, that kind of carbon might be available from a neighbour or a, you, know, you talk to people at the community garden and you'll find that people have resources that you need and will want something that you've got abundance of. So you yeah, get in contact with them. We are, we are rich in one thing, people and waste. So um, you know, might as well make the most of one of the, the big benefits we have living in an urban... Um, uh, what's the word? It's nice. Uh, environment. Environment. <laughs> and, uh, and utilize all of everyone's waste as your free um, organic material for your garden. So, you know, we can buy all this stuff every time, or we can actually start what I call nutrient cycling. So, we can start thinking about how the, the carbon and the nitrogen and all the other minerals and elements, how they're actually going to make it from your food waste and your prunings and everything else back into the soil because we want to close the loop on these nutrients. Once we spend a bunch of money improving the soil and putting kelp and rock minerals on the soil, the last thing we want to be doing is throwing our tree planting, our tree clippings and mulch and everything on the verge for the council to take away. And then going back down to Bunnings next weekend and buying more fertiliser and minerals off Bunnings so I can grow more trees, so I can chop them down, put them on the verge and go and buy some. <laughs> But, but it's what we do. Um, certainly when I moved to Perth, I looked at people's verges and I said, you know, I, that person is a good gardener. I can tell because of all the green waste they have on their verge. Man, they must be growing some good stuff. And then, you know, as I, as I had this realisation, I was thinking, geez, they're doing some serious money and, and what a waste. You know, that could be pruned more often and mulched and put back on their garden. And then they would be actually increasing the fertility of their gardens every year. So I'll put this to you, if the sun's energy is free and photosynthesis just works naturally, a garden should be more productive every year, at least over winter when water is free, shouldn't it? So the productivity and the ecology, I guess the carbon capital in the backyard, should increase every year if we get it right. 
because sunlight's free. But when we chop down huge amounts of our trees and put them on the verge, we've just lost all of that surplus. Um, so we want to avoid that if we can. It's harder at the start, but as you get better at gardening, have a mulcher, learn to prune earlier and have finer prunings, then it's easier to start cycling all of that stuff in the garden. And there's a catchphrase I've got that uh, superfood comes from super soil, not Peru. So, you know, there's a very trendy superfood movement out there now where only the good stuff come, is imported. Well, it is that way. But if you think about Peru and Andes and all those places where the superfood is coming from, what are their soils made of? Mountain rock, basalt. So, right there, they're growing in 100% rock minerals. You know, there might be a little bit of something, there's certainly not much sand. So, you know, we can grow in 100% rock minerals too, but it would be a very expensive process to get all those in the, in the soil. Um, we don't need that many. Plants only need tiny traces of minerals. So tiny traces of trace minerals, hence why we call it trace minerals, um, and even small amounts of the macro elements, um, MPKs and other ones like that, calcium. Uh, so we don't need to be adding these mineral fertilisers to our soil every year. We should be able to put a slow release hit in the soil as we build the soil with something like rock minerals and kelp, and then maybe once again the next year, but then that stuff should stay in the soil for five years if we have decent quality soil, we're not watering too much, and we're not throwing out all of the fertility on the verge every week. Um, you can't read any of that writing down the bottom, but that's deliberate. That, they're all the elements that are in rock minerals. So when you go and buy a rock mineral or rock dust or something from a, a garden supplier, it's a, it's a really dense amount of trace and other minerals. And you know we're all taking, well a lot of us are taking mineral supplements and things. You know it's, it's the same stuff but for plants. And when plants uh, with relationships with uh, bacteria and fungi, when they mine these minerals in the soil and put them into plants, then they're actually um, metabolizable for us. You know, the, the, the goodness and the minerals in the plants are what we, our makeup is made to absorb. Our makeup is not made to absorb a rock mineral powder tablet. You know, that's what the plants and the bacteria are for. So it costs money. We certainly want to be using. Um, using the minerals in the soil and not wasting the minerals in the soil. But we do need to remineralize because we've just got sand. We're breaking now. How about that? So happy to answer questions during the break. Um, food out the back, drinks out the back. As I say, uh, in the back corner there's a little white business card with terrapermadesign.com.au on there, which you can go and access all that notes yeah. from afterwards. And uh, happy to answer questions before we get started. I think we've got about 20 minutes for a break, so it's a bit quick. soils, composting things, how to put uh, liners down to, to stop uh, water leaching out of your garden. Um, I guess all of that, that, those topics and that material is on our website. So if you're looking at containerized gardening, we start talking about wicking beds and putting liners in the soil. Um, if you're talking about building soil, putting clay in and remineralizing, you're looking for notes on our workshop like soil building workshop. So when we run a, a workshop like this at a community garden and it's on how to make uh, soil from sand, then all the material and all the instructions and the products to use and where to get them from generally are all in those workshop notes. So hopefully you know, you'll find that helpful afterwards. We are very happy to receive emails as well. Um, so there's a contact us on there. So if, it, if you can't find the information you're after, it doesn't mean it's not on our website because there's a lot of information on there but I appreciate that it might not be obvious to you what workshop it would be in. So feel free to ask a question, like I want to know what types of clay I can add, where would I find it? It's very quick for me to just link the bits of information that are useful for you. So don't, don't be afraid to do that. So moving on, we, uh, you know, I, I have this um, 
this this thought process, and uh, you know, I guess it's it's personal, but I see gardens uh, as tree centric. Now, I'm a I'm a garden designer. I don't like to do garden designs for people. I like to educate people so they can design their own gardens. That's a much better result. Um, otherwise, I'm telling you what you want, which is not what I I prefer you to be figuring out what's important and then starting to create your own garden. You will create a garden that you are capable of managing and you can grow and learn with the garden as the garden grows. You know, when someone puts in a huge garden for you and it's a really intricate garden that needs lots of care and experience, you're not at that level yet. So the idea of you know, what we're talking about today is some important things for you to consider as you're developing and setting up your gardens. Um, so you can just set up small, sensible, appropriate gardens to learn uh, all of these new skills and experiences about. You will not understand how to add clay to soil if you're not trying to put a garden bed soil together. You know, it's, it's just information when you're not ready for it. So what I'm giving you today, what we're giving you today is a bunch of information Hopefully, once you hear about it, you'll, you'll, when you're on that little journey of um, pulling out weeds, you'll go, oh, I remember that guy said we could eat some weeds. I've got a lot of weeds to pull out here. And this is worth 10 minutes of my time to figure out which ones I can eat. Um, so jump on the website and then look up Perth Edible Weeds Guide. It's on our website. And there's some really easily identified, very common weeds there. And some of them, like purslane, have the highest omega-3s. Uh, some of them, like English dandelion, are the second most highest mineralized plant matched to human needs of any plant in the world. Um, so, you know, if you're talking superfoods, a lot of them are growing there as weeds. And I guess the understanding is more about valuing them as, as something as a highly mineralized plant that has gone and got minerals from a crappy soil and brought them to the surface of the soil. So we may not want to eat them, but hopefully we start to value the fact that that is like uh, rock minerals right there in, in plant form. So we don't pull it out and put it in the bin. We might not want to eat it, and it might be poisonous for the chooks or something, but we certainly want to just use it as compost. So chop them off, leave them on the soil, and let nature start to remineralize and rebuild these soils with what it uses for that purpose, which is weeds. <coughs> um, so this idea that gardens are tree-centric, you know, that forest there, uh, in summer, in Jetto's patch, there's almost a closed canopy. There's probably 10% sunlight coming through the canopy. And they're still growing all of their edibles underneath that canopy. And I tell you, in there, it's like a tropical rainforest. The humidity is high, there's no hot breezes running through, making it dry. So, yes, you can achieve shade with a shade cloth, but as someone said, that it doesn't do anything, any evaporation, any cooling. Shade cloths just make your space hotter. Mm. They stop the sun, but they make your space hotter. So the plants are really not going to be that happy, because it's already bloody hot. Um, so thinking about trees, you know, what what and thinking what can a tree give us? So if I said what do we what does an apple tree give us? And what do we get from an apple tree? Fruit, yeah. So that's really what we think about when we think of an apple tree. But actually, you know, it's a tree and it has a, a its own set of characteristics and uses. It's a deciduous tree. So it means that it can bring in that sunshine in winter and keep that sun out in the summer. Um, you know, it's, it's habitat for birds and insects. It's a beautiful thing to look at, beautiful flowers. The flowers are feeding the bees. Um, so yes, we're getting apples, but this tree is actually giving us a whole bunch of its characteristics and beautifying it and making our space more functional because it's there. We eat the apples for two or three months a year and the tree is there for nine or 12 months a year. So. If we put trees, if we, if we think about our trees and our spaces and put the right trees in the right spaces, we're ending up with a beautiful functional landscape. Um, if you're on a rural design, and we are, but all of the deciduous fruit trees are fire retardant trees. So we can put all of those, those tree belts and those deciduous orchards on the fire front and they will actually stop the fire front. You know, so 
planning and design uh, using trees and plants is, is quite a, a interesting process. Um, it's you know it's a bit more complex than we're going to today, but you know that the, all of those opportunities are there to us when we take the interest and the time to think about tree size. You know, do we want a canopy tree that's flat on top, or do we want a pine tree that's a pencil pine? You know, what do we actually want to achieve <coughs> if we want a dapple, shady um, understory in our backyard? Then we probably want some kind of canopy thing. And if we want uh, sun in winter and shade in summer, then we might want a deciduous canopy species. And, and there are if you go to a nursery and you, you talk about those characteristics, then you'll be given a choice of four or five plants that you can put in. Um, but if you don't think about that, you can't ask those questions when you go to the nursery. Um, one sort of thing I would, I would caution on this, a lot of people are, because we have small urban backyards, a lot of people are trying to use fruiting trees as their canopy or their shade trees. Now, when I think of shade trees, I want to be able to walk underneath them. If I can walk under a tree, it then becomes very hard to protect the fruit or keep the fruit fly off or do any of those sorts of things. So fruit fly is a big issue for us, and a lot of the, the trees that you're tempted to use as a deciduous canopy type tree, peaches, apricots, all of those things, we actually need to cover the tree in a net to protect the fruit from fruit fly. <coughs> so if it's three metres up to four metres high, then it's very hard to do that. You know, so what I'm telling people is we really want to be keeping fruit fly prone trees, um, carrot attack prone trees, anything that we really want to guarantee our harvest of um, tasty fruit and nuts from, we want to keep it to a manageable size so we can protect it. So even though the tree might grow to 10 metres, we might actually deliberately keep it to 3 metres because we want to get the, the harvest from it. So a tree that is a shade tree and a canopy tree could be a mulberry and it could be a fig, but if we wanted to keep that protected and out of fruit fly and out of birds, then it's not sounding like a logical canopy tree, if that makes sense. <coughs> And I guess it's very hard to, to get your head around this idea of really dense planting creating a forest in the backyard. But you know, we've got seven layers in a forest garden if you're trying to achieve what nature achieves in a forest with edible um, plants for us you know, as monkeys. You might not want to think of yourself as a monkey, but we eat monkey food, so we're designing a, a, a rainforest kind of space where we can have nuts and fruit trees and tuber crops and vines and other things in the backyard all available to us four times a year. So you know, have a bit more of a look at that. Canopy layer, subcanopy, shrub layer, herbaceous layer, comfrey and other herbs on the ground, rhizomial, root vegetables, you've got surface covering plants like mint and things running along the ground and strawberries, and then we've got vertical climbers. You know, all of these plants can exist in very similar amount of space and not be in direct competition because they have different characteristics and different needs. So if we're talking about companion planting, that's, that's the, the master plan of companion planting, that idea of getting seven different types of characteristics of trees and bushes and berries in one in the same space as you could have one tree. In an orchard, there would just be an apple. In our backyard, we can have far more than just an apple. We don't need to go through with a tractor and harvest it. Um, you know, for some of us that have been gardeners for a while, I would, I would uh, recommend you start looking at replacing a lot of what are called annual vegetables. So you plant them, they grow, they go to seed, and then you need to plant them again. And that can be six months or eight months. So that's an annual vegetable crop. Start replacing them with perennial vegetable crops. They will taste much the same, but they will be around for three to five years. So we plant them once, and in the first year we don't get much of a harvest. But then we're harvesting this plant for the next five years without needing to grow it as a seed, put it in the seed raising area, stop the bugs eating it, and then get it to grow up to be a plant. So there's lots of good books on those kind of ideas. One is the Seed Savers Manual, which is a really good book on seed saving. There also um, and there's stuff, uh, perennial vegetables books. So the word you're looking, after, looking for is perennial vegetables. And again, if you head to our website as your first stop, and you start looking at the idea of food forests or perennial vegetables, you'll find lots of notes on that and lots of discussion of Perth suitable um, varieties as opposed to 
European or American suitable varieties because we have a, a vastly different one. Yeah, if you can see it, if you want to have a look at these books at, at the end, um, there's some reasonable books here. I'm happy to talk about them. That's the Seed Savers Handbook. So if you're going to start seed saving, I'm going to broach on that topic so I won't cover it much, but this is a, a really good starter book for you. But again, our notes on seed saving cover all of the basics, so they're there for free to download. So if, if you're balking at the idea of the difference between a perennial and an annual, you're probably a new gardener, which is fine. You know, we're all on this journey at different stages. So if all you do after this workshop is um, perhaps get a container, maybe a container garden, a wicking bed, some kind of pot that has the capacity or soil that has the capacity to hold nutrients and water and you grow some really nice cherry tomatoes and, and you think about, oh, he said to uh, plant some other plants in here and you throw some basil underneath it. Now that's a pretty tasty companion happening right there. And it's two plants in the same space as one plant. So we can do that and just keep working on that same principle. But once you've had your cherry tomatoes and your basil for your first year of growing and you've had some good success, then uh, I guarantee you'll be, you'll be hitting it harder next year. Um, some seeds are much easier to save. So I'm not sure whether I've got a section on seed saving. I have. So we talk about seed saving. So why would we want to save our seeds from our garden beds? Free. Free, yeah, for free seeds, definitely. Should be stronger. Stronger, very good, yep. They match the climate. Yeah, yeah very good. So some, some very uh, wisely aware seed savers in the group. The idea is that the plant will genetically change every year to be more suited to your climate and your soil. You know, so when, when we hear about that, that's normally termed an heirloom breed. But when you buy an heirloom tomato from someone in Tasmania, that plant has been bred 30 years for Tasmanian conditions. So I'm not saying it's not a really nice variety of tomato, but I would say it's not a particularly well-adapted variety for West Australian climates. So you know, that is why look, we, we really want the, the, the black Russian tomato. So we're going to buy that seed, but we want to save it at our own plants, really good, healthy-looking tomatoes from really good, healthy plants that are performing well. We want to save that seed next year and plant that one. And then the year after that, we're going to save seed from the one we grew. So it's going to be two generations old. And then the year after that, again. So we end up with this multi-generationally, locally adapted seed. And the beauty of the seed is one tomato or one lettuce is enough seed for five years. And there's hundreds of seeds in a tomato and thousands of seeds in a lettuce here. So you can either use it yourself or you can share it with your friends. So he's got a curious look. So uh, one lettuce going to seed has little flowers, and in each of those seeds, it's probably it'd be 50 to 100 little seeds in each of those flowers, and there's 100 flowers on the plant. I'm just going to see the lettuce like that and see if I see. What's that? I'm just going to see the lettuce sitting like that. Ah, well, see, that is the opportunity you have of uh, plants that are doing not as well as you hoped and have gone to seed. Um, a lot of people were just growing vegetables to eat. Uh, and part of the conversation today is that's okay, we're all trying to grow veggies to eat, but seed saving is really worth your time and worth the effort and worth perhaps foregoing a really nice tomato or, or a good healthy lettuce, letting one of them go to seed or perhaps two or three because a lot of plants are better with cross-pollination of other plants of the same variety. Um, so let them go to seed and then save the seed and plant that next year. So we go down to, to, you know, I'm picking on Bunnings, but it's pretty much the monolith that gets picked on because it is what it is. Um, and we get a pack of lettuce seeds and there's 20 seeds in there and it costs $3.50. I, I just collected 10,000 seeds off one lettuce. So I should be a millionaire. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, but you can try it. But that's the opportunity and that's, that's sharing with your neighbours as well. So I. My seeds, those lettuce seeds might only last three years viability, so you want to be growing them within five years, maybe three years. Normally it's the case of them not all going instantly, you just get less germinating each year past what is logical to save them for. How long can you keep seeds for without planting them? Yeah, good question, and it depends on the variety, and that's why I just 
point you to a table. Yeah, so something like a parsnip seed, eight months. Really painful thing. So if you saved it and went and planted a year later, most of them won't come up. So that's why you'll see people have parsnip patches and they self seed and they fall on the ground and the parsnips come up again. That's the best way to deal with that. But normally it's three years is fine. And then you just start losing viability. Um, yeah. I, we throw it in our compost and all my cherry tomatoes have been getting for about eight years and these self self seed have them all in the garden anywhere. Yeah, kids, so. Kids are all on the front garden as well. The kids around the estate take them off and eat them. Yeah, so look, and the best option for any seed saving, and the best, so we, we make these Antarctic seed vaults, right, and that's where we keep seeds. But the best place to keep seeds and where nature's been keeping them for a millennium is in the soil. Now, the soil is the seed bank. Now, if we want to save seeds and give them away to other people and want to clean them and keep viruses off them, then we might save some seeds, but realistically, we can just be putting them in the compost or letting them fall on the ground. The coriander goes to seed, falls on the ground. Next year, at exactly the right time of year, so none of these what to grow when crap calendars that don't work. <laughs> because you know, we, we don't have any way a reliable, a reliable calendar. You know? So when does spring happen? What are the right temperatures? Well, it's the driest, hottest, whatever on record every year now. So do you transplant them then out of that bed that they were grown last year. Absolutely, if that's what you want to do, transplant them. You're not meant to leave them in the same bed, same place each year. Yeah, so the, the idea of rotating plants around, because if you have the same thing self-seeding in the same bed continuously and start wearing out the beds, yeah, that's an issue. But I, I practice a very diverse planting system where I've got 20 different varieties uh, of all different parts of the crop rotation aspect coming up at any one time. So I, I worry less about that. But certainly you can transplant. Um, but yeah, so the reason to save your own seeds is to have their own, your own better quality seeds to plant next year. Um, and there's a big push going on to control food. You know, you can call it a conspiracy, but it's not a conspiracy. It's just that people would like to control um, your food supply because that makes them lots of money. So. Um, Big companies are buying out um, small seed companies and seed is becoming harder to get and variety and diversity of seed is becoming harder to get. So if we all save 10 seeds and we all share those 10 seeds, we can 10 people can have uh, 100 seeds available to them that are all locally adapted. And that's something we can all do quite simply. Um, the, the beginners start with the easy seeds, peas, beans, lettuce, other things that are really simple to save, and the more advanced seed savers can go on to things like brassicas because they will cross pollinate between lots of varieties. So it's much harder to save those seeds. But um, you know, it's well worth joining. It's a good time to mention there's a Duncraig Edible Garden, which is a local community garden in Joondala. I think it's your first uh, community garden as opposed to private community garden, and that's outside um, Duncraig Library. <coughs> So we'll put some links to that on our website as well. But if you join those kind of community groups, then they will all be saving seed and sharing seed. That's just what they do. You know, it's, it's not a business. It's not. It's just sharing the surplus. If I've got a thousand lettuce seeds and I only need ten for next year. Then uh, you know, 990, whatever it is, is, is a lot to be <laughs> throwing out or having nothing to do with. All right, so jumping across topics a little bit. We're touching on a lot of topics, um, so no apologies for that. And there's more information on all of these on the, sli on the slides and on the, on the workshop notes. Um, what we're talking about now is water efficiency. So we're, we've figured out where to put the garden, and perhaps we've figured out what soil to garden in. We've improved the soil fertility. Perhaps we're even selecting the right kind of plants to grow at the right times of year and using a few perennials instead of annuals. So we're making gardening out a lot easier for ourselves. One of the common problems or issues we, we're asking ourselves is how do we set up a reticulation system? You know, and, and how do we manage the watering of these gardens um, in what is, a, is an arid climate and a poor soil for holding moisture? You know, if we think about the soil, soil should be the best underground water storage so when we've got silica sand, it 
doesn't hold water. The pore space is too large, there's nothing holding it there, and it just runs through. But once we start adding carbon, compost, and clay, and other things, they are holding a lot of moisture. So carbon, so if you're adding compost, or once it breaks down into humus, that holds 40 times its weight of water. You know, that stuff's fairly light, so that's not a, not a miracle number, but it's holding a lot more water than the carbon you put in. And when you're using clays, the reason why we put clays in the sand is because it holds moisture and fertility in the sand. So a bentonite clay might be holding six to ten times its weight in water. You know, so we can either buy a, a 2,000 litre water tank, or we can put on 500 kilos of clay, and we'll have the same water holding capacity. One's in a rainwater tank that takes up space on our property. One's in the soil that passively refills when we reticulate with the sprinklers or when it rains, hydrates the soil. So it's worth thinking about this. I'm not saying we don't need rainwater tanks and rainwater is not really nice to drink, but think about the water systems and where the water is best used. So we, when we talk about water in a, in a garden design and a home design, I talk about doing a water audit. A lot of people will say it's ethically appropriate to do grey water system because that's what everyone's doing. But it does cost eight grand plus for a, for a good big system for a house. That's a lot of money to spend. Um, so we need to be figuring out why we're putting in the grey water system. If we're just putting in the grey water system so we can have 20 minute showers, then perhaps having five, three minute showers and not having enough water for a grey water system might be a more logical, ethical and wallet appropriate solution. So, you know, the idea of a water audit. How much water do we need? How much wastewater are we producing? Where is the wastewater coming out? Is it suitable as grey water? Is it all black water coming out of the toilet and the kitchen sink? Um, you know, do we have access to a bore? And is the bore water quality okay? These are all things that we can check. Um, Rainwater. So, if our rainfall is 700 mil, and our block size is 1,000 square metres block, and we're all getting something like 700,000 litres of water on our block a year in rainfall. Realistically, that's enough for anyone. That's enough almost for a family. So if we were efficiently catching and using all the water that fell on the block, you know, we, we would be okay for water, but we don't. And, and you know, there are lots of reasons why we don't, but I'd just like to throw those ideas out there. You know, we think we have a water scarcity, and yes we do, and yes we're using lots of energy to take salt out of seawater, but actually, if we were really intelligent and planted the right kind of plants and had the right kind of gardens and built up our soil, 700 mil of rain is a hell of a lot more rain than most of the arid countries have, and they're still growing food. Uh, the other option, everyone's water you know, is on the tap, so that's steam water. Look, you can use that to water your garden. Chlorine is an antibacterial agent. Our soils are bacterially rich and healthy by, by design. We've done that on purpose. So, you know, rainwater, um, tap water is not the ideal thing to be putting on the garden by any means. So if we have another source, a bore, a rainwater, or grey water system, then perhaps that's a more logical water to be used. Um, you know, generalisation, but grey water is normally fairly heavily contaminated with salts and other things. So I don't recommend that people put their grey waters in wicking pots or in really high fert fertility organic soils. Because all of the salts and other things will stay in there because all the water is staying in there. But if we use those grey waters on, on trees, on the verges, um, on fruit trees, somewhere where this, it is more of a sandy soil, then those contaminants get flushed out in winter with natural rain. You know, what, how do we water efficiently? Uh, there's micro sprayers, there's drippers, there's pop-up sprinklers, there's all sorts of stuff. There's weeper hoses and subsoil irrigation. Any type of watering system you want, someone will be quite happy to sell you, which is not any different from any other type of gardening. It's a, you know, it's a big market out there of uh, people spending money and buying products. Um, after going through a lot of this, we've got a bore set up at our place. Um, one of the things that went through my hand, head was, if I have a 30 metre deep sand aquifer that just sheds all my water straight from hitting the surface 
down into the aquifer that I tap with my bore, my shallow bore, then I actually have this huge rainwater tank underneath my property. And I can draw off with a bore that water when, and if I don't contaminate it, and if we all didn't contaminate our bore water, and we all impounded the water into our yards as opposed to letting it run down the street for storm drainage, then again, we would all be far better off from a water perspective. Um, but not everyone can have a ball, so do your research on that one. They're not cheap. You might be looking at buy it three to five thousand dollars to set up a ball. Um, the reticulation that, that we tend to use is just that simple old 13 millimeter black poly, <coughs> cheap as chip stuff that you run around the joiners and all the little drippers things. That gets expensive over time. <coughs> but running these things around and putting in drippers where you want them, when you need them. I think we've got some over there. There's a type of dripper that's called a variable flow dripper, which means if I'm growing broad beans one season and oregano the next, I can turn the dripper on or off as is required. Um, the four litre per hour type drippers are fine, but they're always giving four litres per hour. So good for natives and good for other things, but not really so good for veggie patches, where the crops that are going to be next to that dripper change every year. Um, so running these things around and, and putting on the drippers and turning them on and getting as much water as we need. So if I've got a wicking pot and I want to put 10 litres of water under it in a 10 minute watering system, then I can adjust my dripper to do that. If I've got a dripper next to it and I'm running it onto a fruit tree and I don't have a 10 litre reservoir underneath a fruit tree, I only want to put 2 litres of water on a fruit tree, I can set that dripper to go for 2 litres. And we do need to test these things because they just block up. Um, maintenance is required and different water sources will give us different issues with retic. So, but you know, when, when we're going for these all-in-one systems where the drippers are inside the container, inside the tape, and it's all buried underground, um, I do start to worry about the longevity and the issues that we can have with losing that level of flexibility to modify the reticulation. So if I plant a new fruit tree, what do I do then if it's all underground buried PVC? I've got to get a plumber in to put some water onto that fruit tree. If I've got 30 mil black poly, I just get another one of those and I stick it in. Or I run some 3 mil line out of the 13 mil line and I screw on and I have a dripper for the new fruit tree. So I like the idea of that flexibility. Also, if it's not <coughs> buried, then you, it's, you get a far better warning if something's going wrong. Because if it's been buried, you'll see your, your weakest items start to go and you'll start looking at its soil and wondering how we can help it, but it's then a, at least if you've got the drippers around, you can turn it on, you can see what's working, it may just be ants have got in something and you need to take the end off, but you get a much easier system to diagnose the problem. So we've talked about it a fair bit, this is a bit of a schematic, it's a bit hard to see, but it's the idea of that, that barrel, wicking barrel. Um, so we use an olive barrel, so they import olives, it's 200 litres, you cut it in half, you've got 200 litre pots, it's food grade plastic, it's fairly UV stable, I've had them for three years now and they haven't really degraded, so they should be fine, maybe longer. Um, but it is one example, so I've got a pointy thing here. Ooh, yes, and the system. So if this is the container, and that's the top, this brown bit in here is soil, and this bit down here is water. So it's no different from a self-watering pot that have been around for years. It's just a bigger version of a self-watering pot. And we can scale that concept up as big as we want. It can be a bathtub, or it can be an in-ground wicking bed, which is three metres by two metres that has a plastic liner or a clay liner in the bottom. The take-home rule is we're just trying to stop the water and the nutrients from going straight down through the soil. So when we, every time we water, we flush out nutrients out of our soil. If we can't stop that from happening, every time we water, we're reducing the fertility of our soil. And if we water every day, that's a fairly rapid process. We want to try and stop that happening. One. Sorry, that's no, that's right. Here you go. <laughs> I was going to say, whilst we're stopping the water, there's also a drain hole so that we're not then floating our plants out of them. It's important point to remember to put in. Yeah, there's quite a few important points with this. I mean, it's a technique. It doesn't work for everything. But there are lots of good gardening techniques out there. Certainly do a bit of research on each one. Figure out why you're doing it. 
A good example of that is raised garden beds. Now they came from Europe. The point of a raised garden bed was to elevate the soil to get better drainage and to get more sunlight on the soil of the raised garden bed so it would defrost quicker and not frost up as quick as the cold season came in. So instead of having a six month growing season, they could get an eight month growing season. Right, so we're all doing all these raised garden beds in Perth, but the whole function and reason for them in where they came from was the opposite of what we need. We've got too much sun and too hot here and no frozen soil. So if, if you're not raised garden to keep out dogs and chickens or for your back, then you're not raised gardening for a good reason, if that makes sense. Because everything else about raised gardens is bad. Um, so what goes hand in hand with water? How are we good at the time? Need to wind it up to move faster? Um, water efficiency, so we can pull all the water we want in the soil, but we want to start try and keep it in there and we want to stop it coming back out. So if we don't use what's termed a water-wise mulch on top, um, so someone asked if the Joondalup mulch that the council has is a good mulch to be putting on the soil. It's a good feeding mulch if you compared it to hay, but it's not a water-wise mulch if you want to stop, if you want it to be water-wise during summer. And the reason is because the barky stuff has the same capillary action as the soil. We just talked about capillary action bringing the water up in those water reservoir pots. The same action is bringing water from the soil up to the surface that's been blown away by wind and evaporated off by sunshine. So we need to stop this capillary process at the soil surface. And we do that with things that are termed a water-wise mulch, which is a coarse, heavy mulch that has big chunks and a big chunk stop the capillary action, if that makes sense. Again, something to look into in a bit more detail. Um, but that stuff is the best slow-release fertiliser there is. You know, it's, it's complete plant material, street tree mulch. Doesn't matter if it's eucalypts, doesn't matter what it is. It's breaking down bark, leaves, and the wood chips that don't break down, well, that's tops too, because that's actually what we wanted to not break down and sit at the top as the water-wise mulch. So, um, good news there. Um, pests and weeds. And we've talked about it a fair bit already. I think what, what we need, yes they are a problem, and yes we might need to use an exclusion product to try and stop them eating our plants. In my mind, if I'm going to spray my veggies with some crap, I might as well buy them from the shop. Because that's what conventional farmers are doing anyway. It's probably going to be cheaper in the long run to buy your veggies from the store from dodgy agricultural systems um, than it is to grow them at home. So, you know, we all need farmers. I don't want to have too many cracks at them, but the whole point of growing homegrown veggies is so we can keep the sprays off them, remineralise them and keep them really healthy and local and minerally good. So if I can't control the pests by having predators around, because my backyard's too small or too young, I mean, we don't have predatory biology ar arrive overnight might take you three years of developing your backyard with grevilleas and bottle brush and ponds and stick piles and rock piles and uh, nectary type plants, umbilifers, carrots and brassicas and other things going to seed. It might take three years before you start to see the birds and the insects and the other predators start to controlling the pests. Now that's a long time and that is in a backyard where we can have all these things in there. So if we can't have all these things because you've got a small patio that's about the size of a barbecue, then the thing we're after, I'm going to hold up my dodgy looking fruit plant here. So the same nest we would put over the fruit trees to keep the fruit fly out, we can put over the veggies to keep nearly all of the veggie pests out. So if we've got a problem with white caterp caterpillar, we've got a problem with snails, we've got all those sorts of things, intelligently putting this mesh over and covering up our crops will keep them out. Now, most things you can harvest the vegetables and the fruit, even if it's covered in that. It won't stop it forming, but it might stop the seed from being viable next year because the bees couldn't get onto the plants, if that makes sense. But what I'm saying is if, if, we, if we are early on in the food growing stage and we recognise that we just don't have enough collateral around to help us, perhaps we're going to use some protective mesh. And um, if we're in a small micro space and we really don't have habitat around us, then let's use some of that too. Because we're going to eat 100% of the vegetables that are in there anyway. 
Um, is that a bumming supply? No, that's from <laughs> net, net makers in Zebra Lakes. There's some, there's some in Bunnings, I mean you could use a mozzie net, but mozzie nets aren't UV stable and some of the ones in Bunnings the pore size is too big to keep our fruit. So we need to make sure we're getting a veggie net or a fruit fly net. And there are really expensive versions and they are fairly um, price appropriate versions. But it does cost, I mean it costs about $50 to buy netting to cover a fruit tree, uh, a, a 3 by 3 fruit tree, but that netting is over 5 years old. And tree leaves don't grow through it like it does with a bird net. So the bird, bird net you put on the tree, the tree grows through it, and you rip it every time you take the net off the tree. The fruit fly net, the holes are so fine that the leaves don't grow through. Um, so I guess a, a broader appreciation of the function of pests and weeds. Now before humans came along, pests and weeds were just parts of nature. So you know, they, they were there, they haven't come along with us. Pests and weeds, insects and weeds, all had a purpose and still have a purpose. So if you can read a bit more on that, again, I've got a 30-page workshop on pests and weeds and predatory control um, for people to look through. So, you know, each weeds, recognise which weeds are good. Um, understand that we can use animals in our system. I mean, this is someone using chickens to remove their lawn, the little chicken tractor. It's a bit inhumane because we've got five chickens in a small space, but they're having the time of their lives destroying stuff. And if you've ever known a chicken, that is just what they love doing. So we need to continually move them, but that's what we want to do anyway, because we're trying to destroy the lawn, get the bugs out, and then get ready for the go out and crop. So that could have been Roundup, you know, glyphosate, not very nice stuff, other chemicals worse, or we could run some chickens on there, and I've already said that chickens are pretty good news. Um, and just a slide here of some of the predators that are, that are happening in our backyards. We've got the frogs. So to get the frogs, we're going to need a pond. You know, so ponds are pretty important. Um, we've got paper wasps in the middle. And paper wasps literally come along and eat caterpillars alive. Just chomp them up. And that's that green caterpillar gone. Um, what's on the bottom there is a hoverfly. And the hoverfly larvae are eating all the aphids and the white fly and the scale and the other problems. So we need to be having nectaries for the hoverfly adults makes sense, as well as food for the, for the babies. Um, willy wagtails, nothing, nothing hits flies and blowies and other things, you know, and other sort of flying pests more than the willy wagtail. And the one I've noticed the most in our backyard at the moment is the wattle bird. Um, so that is just getting everything. I mean, they're voracious. I'm glad I don't want to eat insects. Because if I did, they'd be in some pretty heavy competition with me if I was trying to find insects to eat. So, um, Can I just add on to that? Is that I guess uh, it's my little bug there, as it were. <laughs> that um, if you find something in your garden, research it. Make sure the only thing it's doing that you're seeing it doing is its only purpose in the garden. Because there are quite often different life cycles of certain creatures. You also might have misunderstood what it was actually doing in that it may have actually been feeding on the thing that was feeding on your food. Um, there are some, and, and my favourite bit is, is you know, the massive hawk moth caterpillars that you get that can be voracious. Well, the moths of that are the nighttime pollinators, so your dragon fruits and that kind of thing. So it's not saying, you know, let them go berserk if, it, if it's causing you angst and removing all your prop, prop. But make sure if you want to deal with something, you know what you're losing from your garden system. You understand and you're making a conscious choice of removing that item. Or leaving them there and giving the predators a bit of a feed for the next X years rather than doing it for them. Sorry, can I ask what is Bobtails, which are pretty hard to get in the backyard, but, but can come around. Um, ducks would, but I don't really want ducks in my backyard. Some chickens can be trained to eat, but it's not a commonality. Um, there are certainly rats and snails and a few other things. When you, when you put the wrong uh, mulches on slaters, there will be excesses of, of things beyond what would be manageable in a normal ecosystem. So you know, there is work for us to do. 
So the idea, I guess, our default position is control life with life. And so if we are seeing something be overabundant and we can control it with a life system that's useful, then that's a surplus. That's a yield. We just got another yield out of our garden. And the yield is beautiful insects and animals and predators and usefulness. Um, if we poison it and it becomes a poisonous bit of bug on the ground, then we've just toxified our system. So control life with life. Same reason we're controlling the grass with the chickens rather than spraying it and poisoning it. It won't always work, but that should be the first thing we ask ourselves. We're going to move into questions shortly. So I'll, um, I think uh, the last couple of slides are there. So ponds, a pond can be, we've got big fiberglass ponds in the ground that are three metres long and half a metre deep. We've also got the same little olive barrels as very functioning ecological frog ponds. Um, a few goldfish in a pond will control the, uh, the mosquitoes and live quite comfortably in the pond. And if you have enough vegetation to have a healthy pond, so that's a fair few different plants, then the frogs will have plenty of space to, to spawn so the, the predatory fish can't eat them. Because this idea that frogs have, have not had predatory fish in the last million years is pretty odd too. You know, people say you can't have goldfish and frogs. Well, it, it existed before. It wasn't goldfish, but it was some other predatory fish. And so now we find ourselves at question time. We have a fair bit of question time. Um, I don't know how to, I guess, structure it easily. How much time do we have left? Just over 20 minutes, but I wanted to follow up on the question that didn't get to the end. I'm just not talking. Um, we talked a bit about snails and then we talked about the life with life. There are then beyond that exclusion, which is like the netting type thing, and there are different levels, I guess, of, of reducing the access snails have to our plants and that side of things. So there's options of exclusion. In some cultures, it's a delicacy. Well, that's the other thing. Teaching people to And, and, and you know, it's queasy for us now, but I think you'll find in, in the future of sustainable animal industries, insects are going to be coming. And uh, it's going to be something that we're going to have to be less squeamish about. I know there's a bunch of communities around Perth that have been having snail eating competitions this spring. But the other thing is... Yeah, that's right. So we can all give them the snails that they need for their competitions. So I'm happy to donate as well. Yeah. And that's the thing. If you haven't put chemicals in your garden, then you know what's in your pests. I guess the other thing is accumulate these things. So if it was a rat, we, we, we are breeding rats. Humans and rats get on really well. We have too many rats and we don't have any predators because there's nowhere for the predators and the raptors to live and we don't want the cats out there eating other things, so we're going to have this problem. Um, I bought a little, one of those electrocution traps. Now, I don't, I'm not endorsing them because I don't know how well it's going to work, but the idea is that I can now non-toxically kill a rat because there are too many in the area because we've bred them as humans, um, and I can put it under the fruit tree. And I don't need to buy blood and bone this year. <laughs> What's wrong with that? There's no poison. Yeah, up the back yep. Yep. Sorry. I just wanted to ask about um, slaters. Yep. Know, so a lot of a lot of new gardeners will have millions of slaters. Um, so I'll try and repeat the question if we haven't heard it, so everyone gets benefit from it. So slaters are those little bugs that roll up that look grey, cool bugs, slaters, whatever you want to call them. Look, they are the primary agent for breaking down um, fine mulch. So when we use hay and straw and grass clippings and manures on our garden, we breed up millions of slaters because it's their job to break that material down and make it available to the soil. So what can we do about it? Well, we can put in more predators. We can let the chickens run in there. We can make trips, uh, traps that the slaters fall into. We can put half citrus, um, a grapefruit or something that's really big, that's had the, the juice squeezed out of it on the ground and all the slaters get in there and then we can knock them into a bucket and we've caught them. What do you do with them then? Well, that's up to you. Chickens, <laughs> chickens do like them sometimes. Um, but So the answer all, to all of these things is always that we are breeding millions of slaters by our habits. So we need to use coarse mulch and different mulch, not just straw and grass clippings and other things. I mean, if, if we're doing that, we're recognising that we're breeding the agent that breaks that down because we're putting all its food source on the ground. 
and, and grass clippings and, and hay doesn't turn into soil food. It has to go through something first, and the slater is what it goes through. So use less of that and bring in a few more frogs and lizards and birds and other things, and you will find it's under control. And don't take out all your weeds. Sorry, I give long answers. <laughs> so when we remove all our weeds out of the garden, if a slater eats 5% greenery, we weed all of the weeds and get this garden bed ready and we go down to Bunnings and we buy six seedlings for $400 and we plant them in the ground, <laughs> then the slaters wake up at night. There's still a million slaters there, but they were in a forest the day before and they were happy just nibbling on the edges and you've just put in four corn seedlings. So they're going to kill your four corn seedlings because that's the only greenery that you've left them. Now, if you were eating your weeds and not pulling out all your crops and pra pra um, practicing diverse planting, you wouldn't come across that problem. Um, we've heard that coffee grounds is good for getting rid of snails. Would that be all right for your garden? Sprinkling stuff like coffee grounds? Uh, coffee grounds is awesome for the garden. So if you can go to the coffee store and you can get 20 kilos of free coffee each, well, each just, week. We have the little pods yep. and we just cut it open and collect the coffee out of it because the you know constitute to send it back to them anyway. Yeah. You can recycle the aluminium pods that they're in. Yep. Um, and then just dry it out and sprinkle it down. My understanding is as snails eat with their feet as they move, they don't like to move over a lot of surfaces that have issues. So caffeine is an issue for them, copper is an issue for them, eggshells is an issue for them, other chemicals are an issue for them. So yeah, good and no no issue with tox toxicity for your, for your soil. Coffee grounds is an aw awesome source of carbon. So you can either go and buy cocoa peat and pay lots of bucks for it, or you can go to the coffee store and get cocoa peat flavored with coffee free. At last we make our own fermented kefir and often we've got more than what we can use and wondering whether the curds and the whey from it are okay to put in the garden. Yeah, no, no issues with that. As I said, anything that is organic can go into the soil system. But when we put in big chunks of meat and other things, we're obviously going to have less desirable outcomes. But kefir grains or the extra curds of that will be fine. I mean, any of that kind of stuff, I tend to just put it under the soil a bit and put a bit more extra carbon wood chippy stuff with it. So if it breaks down and nitrates and other less desirable compounds come out of it, they get sucked up into the carbon <coughs> by the nappy, and then it just starts to break down. So, yeah, no dramas with any of that. Oh. <coughs> Obviously the people at the front are those needy people that ask lots of questions. The people at the back have been those kids at school that sat at the back. I haven't had any rocks, so I won't complain. Um, so they don't turn tree premiums out, but are there any trees that we really shouldn't recycle into the garden? No, I don't think there is. Um, certainly it's better to recycle everything than it is to bring anything in, because there is risks of dieback. So, you know, lots of the garden, the, the street tree prunings, if you like, are eucalyptus, and quite often a tree will get pruned because it's in decline, so it could have dieback in it. So while I think it's more beneficial to bring mulch into our systems and, and build healthy ecologies, and that is the best resistance to dieback, healthy soil stops dieback. So you know, if we don't have healthy soil, we won't stop dieback anyway. So if our default position is not bringing in mulch and having unhealthy soil, well, we're going to lose the dieback war. Anyway, so I digressed a bit, but any plant material is fine. I mean, things like oleander, you know, a lot of people have oleander, and it's meant to be really poisonous. But if you wear your protective stuff and you're not putting it all in one spot and you're not sucking on the sticks as you cut them, <laughs> then uh, it's, all, it's all organic matter. Things like, uh, what's that thing that's growing everywhere at the moment? T tobacco? No. Cotton. Yeah. You know, the close. Um, castor oil plant. Oh. The castor oil plant has the most toxic chemical known to man or something in its seed. So if you ever want to knock anyone off, look at it. <laughs>